there is nothing more frustrating than spending hours trying to figure out why your Nest.js application isn't working. So in this video, I'm sharing with you the techniques that I've used to debug real-world Nest.js applications, and these techniques have helped me a lot, and I'm sure they'll help you as well. But before we dive into the debugging techniques, let me give you a quick Nest.js tip that might save you a lot of time. You have most likely encountered these type of errors where Nest.js can't resolve some dependencies, so in my case, it's fairly simple. But if you have some dynamic modules or complex dependencies, it might get very complicated to debug and you might want to have more information in the terminal. And in order to do that, in your package.json, you can add some environment variables to your uh, script, which is the nest.js debug environment and you set it to true. And now if you save and restart your uh, nest.js application, so let me stop it. And now if I restart it, you will see that in the logs, I will have much more information in there. In the terminal, I have all informations about Nest.js trying to resolve the dependencies. So in my case, it was fairly simple because I know that the config service can't be resolved. So in order to fix that in my user module, I can just uncomment the code and now everything will be working as expected. Now that we have that little trick, we can dive into more debugging techniques. To make things easier to understand and remember, I've split the techniques into three categories. So you might already be familiar with the first two, but the last one is specific to Next.js, so stick to the end to see what that is. We've all done this, something doesn't work, we just add a bunch of console log statements and we try to figure out what's going on. Honestly, I know console log doesn't have a good reputation, but I personally do this all the time and I think it's a great way to get started when you debug. And that's the first debugging category, which I have called terminal-based debugging. And the first technique is just to use the console log. So terminal-based debugging is fairly simple. You just go in your, in your terminal and then you just scan the messages in your terminal to understand what's happening. Here, I just have some console logs that I've added in my code. Console log is one way of doing this, but it's actually very easy to do better than console log. So instead of console log, you can use the Nest.js logger. The easiest way to use the Nest.js logger is simply to create a new instance of the logger in your class. So logger comes from the Nest.js common library. And then instead of using console log, you can just use your logger. And here you have a bunch of methods that you can use. But if you have some messages that you know are specifically from debugging, you can use the debug method. And in there, you can just add the message you want to uh, display in your console. So here I've put the same as the one that I had in the console log and I can remove this. Using the logger is a great way of keeping things consistent, which makes things easier for you and for other developers as well. On top of that, you can add extra information to the log messages that will help you during debugging. For starter, you can add context to each class logger that you instantiate in uh, every class that you have a logger. So here, I'm just using the class name for each of my logger. And then when you look in the terminal, you'll see that the log messages have the context in which they were logged. So you can easily track which part, which class of your application has generated the different uh, messages you see in your terminal. On your local machine, this can be more than enough because you send one request at a time and it's quite easy to see that these two logs are related. But if you are on a production application, you might have a lot of requests and it's not easy to see which log relates to which one. To help with this, you can add a request ID or a correlation ID to the log messages. So this will help you spot which logs are related to the same request. In my example, I've generated a request ID using a timestamp, and then I'm passing the same request ID to my find one uh, method in the user service. And in there, I can reuse the same ID and log it as an extra parameter of the debug method. And if I send a request to my application, I can see that in the logs, the two, um, the two logs have a request ID object. And here you'll see that it, it shows as two separate logs. So a little trick that you can use as well to have them as the exact same logs is instead of passing an extra object um, to the debug function, you can actually pass a single object with a message object and pass in your message. And now um, if you send a request, you'll see that the logs should be in the same in the same line. So in the same line, I have my message and my request ID. And of course, you can add whatever extra information you think is going to be relevant during debugging. So here I can add user ID, for example, uh, if I think that might help me debug later on. 
Personally, I found that issues during development can be solved quite quickly using the terminal-based debugging, either through console log statements or the logger. But having said that, log messages, especially debug messages, are really crucial when it comes to production environments because you can't just throw around random console logs in a running application in production. So you really need some uh, log messages in those environments. And from my experience, it also works quite well when you already have some sort of intuition of what could go wrong. But the way I see it is that terminal-based debugging is like trying to figure out what's going wrong with your car by just listening to the engine. But if that doesn't work, you really need to open the hood and see exactly inside your car what's going wrong. And it's the same for debugging your app. If you can't figure out what's going on by using the terminal messages, you'll have to look inside your app using a debugger tool. VS Code already has a debugger tool that you can use. And to do that, you just have to go to the debugger tab. And here you can create a launch.json by clicking this uh, line here. And then you can select the Node.js. By default, you have some boilerplate configuration, but what I'm going to do is remove all of this and I'm going to paste some configuration that I've already had. And here it's a very basic configuration. What I'm saying here is that the type of the application that I'm running is a node application because Nest.js is a node application. Then it will launch my application, the name, you can put whatever you want. And the idea here is to run our application using NPM and with the argument run and start dev. Once you have the configuration uh, set, you can start your application with the debugger. To do that here, it already has the configuration selected. So the same name as we had here. You press play here and you'll have your application started with the debugger from VS Code. Now that you have your um, application started with the debugger, you can add some breakpoints. So here, if I go in my, um, let's go in the user service. Here I can set some breakpoint. So to do that, you just click on the side and this will add a breakpoint. And if I send a request to my application, it will stop at the breakpoint. So the great thing with a debugger tool is that you really have visibility of everything that is happening inside your application. So first of all, you have access to the variable values. So here there is the variable ID. I can see it has the value one and same for request ID. I can see its value and you also have access to the, to the call stack. And additionally, with the debugger tool, you can also use the step over uh, functionality to really execute your code step by step or you can use uh, the step into or the step out, etc. So here I'm just going to continue to finish my um, request. But if you don't want to launch your application with the debugger, you can also attach it to an already running process. If you appreciate the insight on this channel and you are serious about mastering Nest.js, I highly recommend checking out my course, Build Production Grade Nest.js Applications. Inside, I'll walk you through the exact system senior backend engineers use to build robust, scalable Nest.js applications. You'll get actionable advice on which patterns to use and when to use them. And I'll personally answer your questions in the course community. You can click the link in the description to join the course. So first of all, what you have to do is go back to your, um, to your launch.json file. And here you can add an extra configuration. So this time the configuration will not uh, launch your, your application it will simply attach it to an existing running application. So here the request is going to be attached and this is just the default port. Once you have your new configuration, you can start your application, but this time instead of using npm run start dev like we usually do, this time we are going to use the debug script instead. So if you look in your package.json, the only difference between the start dev and the start debug is that the start debug has the debug option. And this will allow us to attach a debugger to a running application. So here I've started my application. And now what I can do is select the attach to Nest.js app config and press the play button. And now I can even see there is a debugger attached. And if I send a request, we have the same behavior. And once again, you can go through the variable, the call stack, etc., to, to try to debug your application the same way. So with VS Code, whether you launch your application with the debugger or you attach the debugger, you can really see what's happening inside your application. But here as well, I was working with a very simple application with just a controller and a service. So it's quite very easy for me to just 
send a request whenever I want to see what's happening. But when you are repairing a car, for example, you sometimes want to test just a specific part, for example, the brakes or the headlights without having to run the entire car and start the engine. So it's the same for your application. So in a large Nest.js application, you might want to debug just one part of the system without to having constantly to send the request and trigger the full request lifecycle. But luckily there is a Nest.js feature that allows you to target a specific part of your application. And here is how it works. Instead of using the main.ts file as the entry point of your application, you are going to create a brand new file that will be the new entry point. So I've called mine debug.js, but the name doesn't matter. In this file, you also have a bootstrap function just like we have in the, in the main.ts file. But instead of using next factory create, we are going to call the repel function from the Nest.js core library. And that function takes one argument, which is the root module of your application. But you could also decide to use a different module here if you just want to target an isolated module. Then in your package.json, you can add a brand new script. Here, I'm just going to copy the one, uh, the start dev one, and I'm going to call this debug. And the difference here is that on top of the watch option, I'm also going to pass the entry file um, option and I'm going to set it to the debug file. So you just have to make sure that the name of the entry file here matches the file name you've created. Then in your terminal, you can just run npm run debug. In the repel mode, you have an interactive terminal where you have some really useful commands that you can use. And the first one you can use is the debug um, function. And this will give you a list of all the classes that are in your application. But what's really useful for debugging here is that you can call the public method of any of the classes you have in your application. For example, if I wanted to call the find one public method of the user service class, I would do this by using the dollar function. And in there, I pass in the class name, which is users service. And then I can just call my uh, function with find one and pass in a um, an argument, which is the user ID. And this will return a value here. And this way you can really test some part of your application without having to send a request to the server. But even with the right approach, debugging can become a proper nightmare if you don't have a clear idea of your application structure. So you can watch this next video where I show you a tool that will reveal exactly what's in your application and how things are connected to each other.